Good morning and welcome to the second program in Oxy's 2020 Alumni Seal Conversation Series. I'm Margo Clifford, class of 2012. And for those of you who have volunteered with the Office of Admission or served our reunion committee or participated in one of Oxy's alumni affinity groups, you may remember me from when I worked at Oxy, first in the Office of Admission and following that in the Office of Alumni and Parent Engagement. Um, I was absolutely thrilled when my fabulous former colleagues in alumni and parent engagement asked me to introduce today's speaker. As a religious studies major at Oxy, I had the distinct honor and privilege of learning from and being mentored by Professor Dale Wright. And those of you here today who have also had the chance to learn from Dale know just how genuinely remarkable a teacher he is, both in and outside the classroom, and the lasting impact he has on those lucky enough to be his students. But before I introduce Dale in earnest, I want to take a brief moment to welcome Oxy's 16th president, Harry Elam Jr., who kicked off his presidency on July 1st with a welcome message that all alumni and current parents should have received by email. Uh, you can visit the Oxy website or contact the alumni office if you did not receive a copy of that message. And we look forward to opportunities over the course of the summer and fall to e-meet President Elam and welcome him and his wife, Dr. Michelle Elam, to the Oxy community. I also have a couple of quick housekeeping items before we dive in. Uh, Professor Wright will speak for about 30 to 40 minutes, during which time I will be off camera. Uh, if you have questions for Dale, you can submit them using the chat feature at any time during his remarks. And once he's finished presenting, I'll be back on camera to share your questions with him. Uh, we'll do our best to get to all of the questions asked with our allotted one hour time frame, but I can't promise every question will be answered, so I do appreciate your understanding there. And finally, this session is being recorded, so if you lose your internet connection or you have to leave early, rest assured the recording will be available online in a couple of days. Um, with that behind us, it is now my absolute pleasure to welcome today's speaker, the one and only Dale Wright, Oxy's David B. and Mary H. Gamble Professor in Religious Studies and Asian Studies Emeritus and recipient of the 2020 Honorary Alumni Steel Award for Faculty Emeritus. After earning his BA from San Diego State and his PhD from the University of Iowa, Dale joined the faculty at Oxy in 1980, teaching courses on the religious traditions of East and South Asia. Over the course of his 38 years at Oxy, Dale served at various times as chair of both the Religious Studies and Asian Studies departments, as well as president of the faculty council. His most recent books are The Six Perfections, Buddhism and the Cultivation of Character, What is Buddhist Enlightenment, and Buddhism, What Everyone Needs to Know, all published by the Oxford University Press, and all of which I highly recommend. And I think that those who know Dale would agree that his professional and academic accomplishments are matched by an unparalleled generosity of spirit, incomparable wit, and incredible wisdom. And I personally could not be more grateful to Dale for sharing all of those wonderful qualities with his students, even long after they have graduated. I'm very excited to have him here with us today. So without further ado, Dale. Thank you, Margot. That was wonderful and generous. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Monica, for setting all this up. Um, it's, um, it's a great honor for me. Um, but especially thanks to Occidental College alumni who presented me with the Alumni Seal Award. It's a great honor. I'm deeply honored. I loved the opportunity to teach at Oxy. Um, being a professor there was just perfect for me. And I miss it. Well, sometimes. Um, but, um, I uh, look forward to talking to some of you through questions um, and I hope for future opportunities to get together with you. But mindful of my assignment here, I'm gonna get started. I'm gonna go for roughly half of our time and then leave lots of time for question and answer if I can manage it, we'll see. So obviously we're in unprecedented, very uncertain, even unnerving times times that call upon each of us to reach deep for added resources, stability, wisdom, strength to get through all this. So mindfulness meditation um, is potentially one of these resources, an available tool that can help us face crises, ones that have ambushed us in the past few months. And although it's one tool among many, um, it's one that has implications for literally everything we do. So let me explain. So mindfulness, uh, as you know, is Buddhist, and many of you learn um, about Buddhism from me. It's one type of several, many types actually, of Buddhist meditation. And there are different varieties of, of mindful meditation. Um, you probably know, um, because you've taken an interest in this, that 
Mindfulness is being taught in schools, hospitals, businesses, fire departments, churches, mosques, mosques, synagogues. It's just um, ubiquitous. So at this point, it's hardly Buddhist, right? It's everyone's possession and open to be transformed in whatever ways anyone can, can work with it um, to, to do. So think of it as uh, tools for self-awareness, for self-rule, and for self-transformation. I'm going to talk about it and in a bit of an unorthodox way, so excuse me on this one, but as having three layers or levels of mindfulness meditation. There's a lot apparently to be mindful of. So start here. Basic definition, and this is how mindfulness is typically practiced in the United States. It's defined as paying attention purposefully and non-judgmentally to your experience in the present moment, whatever that is. To basically to just be aware of what's going on, to, to be attentive to it, to be um, in the present moment and not drifting off in mental space as we frequently do. Mindfulness isn't primarily a way to make you feel better, although it certainly does that. It's a way to make you a more effective participant in what's going on, more present, more alert, attentive, mindful. So um, it's, it's, it's a way to really be there and not be drifting off. So uh, it's also an opportunity when you do this kind of mindfulness meditation to just, all you do is watch what your mind does, just pay attention. So you get to, in a sense, take an inventory of your typical mental states. Find out who you are. Um, we, what do we experience in the course of an hour, in the course of a day or over time? We typically don't know because we're just there in our experience. So um, uh, the first two levels, I said we're going to talk about three levels. The first two are um, mindful awareness of just things you observe in the world and then um, mindful awareness of what you're doing in your own internal inner space. Those two obviously come together all the time, but you can be, you can be aware of them and we can distinguish between them. So at the first level, mindfulness is simply learning to be observant, alert, awareness of your environment, of your physical life too, awareness of your respiration processes, um, awareness of pain in your body, um, awareness of um, just what's there to be seen. What do you notice? How observant are you? What do you notice when you walk through your house? Typically, because it's your house, the answer is pretty much nothing, unless something's really out of order. What do you notice when you walk through your neighborhood? Well, we're oftentimes not there, so we don't see much. I've sometimes asked students, um, we're a classroom in, um, um, students, I know they have to walk past the Rose Garden in order to get there, and I ask them, where is the rose garden anyway? Have you noticed where it is? And some of the students said, no, is there a rose garden? I said, no, well, yes, you just walked by it. Um, so you walk by it a thousand times without noticing. Um, one student admitted, yeah, I totally know the rose garden. I steal roses there almost every week for my, for my room. Um, so how do we observe the environment? Are we observant? Are we present? Are we drifting off? A mindfulness meditation has you just notice when you drift off into making plans, okay, just be aware of that, okay? Um, if you're off into anxiety, be aware of that. But um, to be more observant, you focus on what's there, and then when you drift off, you come back and just notice what's there. Think of Sherlock Holmes, right? Sherlock walks into a, a, a crime scene and boom, he's riveted. It's like he's taking a million photographs. Everything as it's relevant, obviously, to what he's looking for. But he's noticing all these things that we wouldn't notice. It's deeply observant. Um, you may know that in Japanese corporate manufacturing plants, they allow workers to take time off to go do meditation practice. Excuse me, my phone ringing. That's not a good thing. Um, and uh, they, on the thought that they will be more alert, more observant, so they can take time off work to do that with instruction, but they, they recognize they'll be more present to what they're doing. 
Um, now, notice this first level is an amoral skill. It has nothing to do with being a good person or a bad person, just more skillful, right? Um, it makes you a better anything. Um, if you're doing childcare, it makes you better at childcare. Um, playing baseball, better at baseball. Um, driver, but also make you a better burglar, better sniper, um, better diamond cutter, better dentist, you know? So picture yourself there in the dental chair being worked on and you're, you're hoping the dentist is really mindful. Like, don't be drifting on. Meanwhile, she's picturing herself on the beach in Mexico. So like, pay attention, pay attention, just be present. Um, so first level is learning to have that degree of presence. Second level is what's going on internally, internal patterns, response mechanisms. How do we respond to what we see? Um, do we understand our, what's going on in our minds? We assume so, but we, when we do this kind of meditation, we discover otherwise. So for example, do you really know what you're doing in there during the day? Mm, what's going on? Can you name your five primary daydreams, for example? Um, are you an athlete, a lover, an investor, a suave partier, a beloved hero of whatever? Um, what do you do when you're daydreaming? How many hours a week do you spend there? Um, what emotional states do each of those daydreams evoke? How do they affect motivation? Um, we reckon as well, we don't really know. We can think back, yeah, I do like the daydream, man. I get to be a hero uh, hitting the home run in the last inning of the game. And I go through that occasionally. I'm embarrassed to mention this advanced stage. Um, or what are your five primary resentments, right? We've all got them. Um, things that happened to us, were said to us, did to us. Um, how often do they come up? Um, how do they affect you? Physiologically, um, heart rate, blood pressure, body temp. Um, how does focus on these resentments that you have um, affect your relation to others as you're going through them? Let's say today you're resenting um, back in middle school, you've got this routine, you run through your mind occasion, you were bullied. And every once in a while you run that little storyline through your mind. How does it affect what you're doing when you're running that storyline through your mind? Um, okay. Um, so, um, knowing what we're doing is very difficult and it takes practice, right? Others, in fact, know a lot about our states that we don't know, right? Um, people I live with, my wife can tell me about my moods and remind me, okay, you're in one of those moods, right? So I'm unaware, I'm there and I'm just doing it, but I'm not really conscious of it, not mindful. Okay, so um, some of you know something called mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is a practice done in hospitals and many places to lower the stress level, to get your blood pressure down. And basically it has you learn to feel your body temp. You do that in meditation. Learn to feel your processes of respiration. Um, learn to know them and to understand how they're related to your stress. Also, um, Learn what your stress creating narratives, the ones that you're always working through your mind, which ones really stress you out. Learn to recognize, okay, I'm doing that again, right? Um, how, do you, how do you come to um, be aware of those? But if you can be aware of doing them, you can undermine them and take that degree of stress off. If um, coronavirus is really stressful to you, know what patterns of worry are building that stress. Get out of it. You can do that by simply knowing these internal patterns, right? Know what your mind does. Okay, third level. Um, consciousness of 
are responses to reality. So world there, our internal response, in view of your values, in view of your ideals. So this is mindfulness of your principles, mindfulness of your aspirations, mindfulness of what you want to stand for. Um, so you train yourself not to lose sight of those and you incorporate those into your everyday, everyday life. You, you, you don't want your values to be something off on the side. You want them to be processed into your mental makeup so that they really do emerge when the time comes when you need those values, right? So um, how do you retain them when you're in a tight spot, when emotions flare? Um, how do you be who you want to be when things are tough? Um, how do you avoid succumbing to impulses that drag you down into lesser values? So let's say you're in, uh, facing people enveloped in hate, right? They hate you. Um, um, how do you prevent hating them right back? Right? How do you prevent make, allowing them to do what you dislike? Right? Um, you don't want to be that, um, but it's a natural response to be drawn into that. Okay, so um, it's important to, of course, acknowledge um, that feeling fearful and anxious is perfectly natural. You have to accept that. It's appropriate in these times. But recognize how fear and anxiety can also escalate. They get up and out of hand and recognize how they can drive you to be ways that you don't want to be. So mindfulness is a strategy to avoid that, to maintain a kind of buoyant, flexible mental state, to steer clear of destructive habits that will drag you down. Okay, so um, we've got these three layers or levels, um, mindfulness as being observant of the exterior world, mindfulness as um, aware of your internal states. Now, working with mindfulness to build values to be effective in your life. So what you do is imagine yourself facing difficult circumstances um, without succumbing to the pattern that you always come to. You always get mad or you always get frightened or whatever you do, but you maintain awareness of your values. Um, you do what you be who you'd like to be. You keep your sense of integrity. So you practice that over and over and over again. You essentially um, run that scenario as a practice through your mind repeatedly until it becomes an option for you. So um, practice never makes perfect, in contrast to this uh, phrase we may, most of us learn, but it almost always makes better. So if you practice playing your musical instrument, let's say you play the sax, you're gonna get better. If you're a basketball player, you practice free throws, you're gonna get better. Um, if you practice facing difficult, mind-numbing circumstances that will take you out of yourself, if you practice doing them, imagine yourself doing it with composure, acting on your values, um, keeping your sense of integrity. Um, if you do that, you have a far better chance of actually doing that. That's the point. You can premeditate through the tough spots. The spots in your life, whatever they are, that like me, you continually screw up. You panic, you make weak moves. So imagine going up on stage, you're gonna give a con concert and you're, you play the sax, but you haven't practiced. You know, you're gonna give a concert and you haven't practiced. Imagine you're in the free throw line, you're ready to shoot that shot, but you haven't practiced free throws. And when you did a long time ago, it didn't go well, you really blew it. Okay, so same thing in life. Imagine yourself facing the next difficult circumstances in your life, and you have practiced that. You haven't really woven a pattern of mindfulness that you want to have represent you into your life. So again, you can premeditate those tough spots. Um, you know, this is done in athletics all the time. Um, so quarterbacks in the NFL, 
um, both run through the, the basic moves that they do. They do it over and so let's say your quarterback, you drop back to pass, you drop back to pass and you run that, you do that over and over. But when you're not on the, on the football field, you run that through your mind, you do mindfulness practice. So all teams have mindfulness coaches now and they teach you how to do this. So basically you recognize, okay, first the left foot goes back, then the right, it's four steps. Then if you're going right, you, you move in this particular way and you mentally script that over and over so that when you're actually doing it, it's just totally a part of the way you act. It's right there in your behavior. Okay. Um, so let's take a situation and run it through, follow it through and, um, and with a couple possible scenarios. Uh, let's take a situation of discord, disharmony, sense of trouble between people, um, conflicts of in interest, tension, comes up all the time, right? That comes up every day. So they're everyday varieties, right? I want to stir fry the vegetables. She wants them, you know, steamed. Um, I want to go to see a play. She wants the movies. Um, just moments of difference, right? Um, there are big ones, there are little ones. There are major ones that disable you. Those are the ones to really work out, but they're every day ones that are irritating. So how do you work those through to keep some presence and composure? Okay, um, so picture big ones too. Um, let's say mm, you're at the protest and um, there's a line of Trump patriots there. They've got their posters. Um, you're in the protest. Um, they're screaming at you hatefully and um, um, then you, you, you see the protest group there, there, they've got their posters and they're screaming back at the Trump people. Neither side can imagine how anybody could think that way, how anybody could do that. And they hate those people. You know, they just despise the other person. Okay. So we all have our in, picture yourself, um, not on one side or the other. You're just responding to that. You're just seeing it. Okay, um, we all have our ingrained habits of response, right? Um, you will have learned, many of you, and I've taught some of you, what's called experience-dependent neuroplasticity. Remember that phrase? Um, it means basically that what you go through habitually, typically, um, gets worked into your neurological system, becomes a brain pattern. Okay, it you just are building ruts in your brain every time you repeat patterns. So, um, let's say we're thinking about a response to facing disharmony of emotional violence, right? You're, you just get really angry, and temper flies, or take the opposite. Um, and there are many of these. I mean, so um, you're fearful, avoidance, you just want to disappear. Um, in mindfulness practice, basically, we notice those reactive habits. How do we typically respond, right? What do we do? Um, we see our patterns reappear over and over again. Um, we might also notice how those patterns either help us or disable us in some way. Um, so we lose composure. We're either fearful or furious both ways of losing composure. We're swept away, basically. Okay. We, we notice some people are able to stay present to some extent, right? Um, they become even more honest, more thoughtful, more sensitive to what's going on, more strategic. They're really there, right? They have a presence that works in their favor, okay? They're going to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Their minds are working, right? They're open. They're not lost in their emotion. They have those emotions, to be sure, 
but they're not lost. Right? They've, they've got themselves. So sometimes when I'm around people like that, I feel like an adolescent among adults, right? These are the people who really can step in and take charge. So we've seen photos of, for example, Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King, videos in some cases of King, standing firm with composure, um, deeply enveloped in their principles and their values. Meanwhile, they're screaming, rock throwing, racists they're facing off against. But they're able to be there, right? They're present, they know who they are, they know what they stand for, their composure, courage, mindful presence is inspiring, right? They've got something that you want, I want. Okay, so um, the initial step is to recognize your own patterns, right? What do I do? Become familiar with the signs that go along with it. You know, blood pressure gets up, hearts racing, bodily functions change. Um, we can name aspects of our life that go with this pattern too. Um, let's say I tend to, am I still there? I just hit a key and blanked out. Am I still good? You're still good, Dale. We can still hear, see and hear you. I can't see anything but me, and that's not good. Um, <laughs> so um, the initial step, simply to explore your own responses, become familiar with their signs, right? Um, we can name aspects of our reactive pattern, like exaggeration, divisiveness. We really get into an us versus them, good, evil, duality. Um, we have an instinct to flee, fight. We see how non-inclusive my reaction is, right? I'm not including others. You know, I'm really showing how diversity, this diversity that I'm facing in this discord, I'm not good at it. Um, so you see how fear and anger undermines our own ideals, makes me someone I don't really want to be. So what I do is then as in practice, if I'm going to practice mindfulness, I go over incidents, I study my own comportment, I evaluate strengths and weaknesses. Then, based on mindful self-awareness, if you're doing this, you design a set of meditation practice specifically for you, where you relive those situations. One, maybe you've gone through um, that you, you didn't do well before, but you script yourself with a pattern that actually works, right? You gradually work towards installing consciously chosen patterns of behavior in those situations. And try to become familiar enough with those alternatives so that they might be there in their mind as, as a possibility at least when crisis comes up, rather than my old maladaptive um, habitual pattern. I've got another possibility there. So in an overt conflict, obviously, this isn't easy. This is incredibly difficult. But you can recognize trigger situations. You can plant new response patterns by like putting them into your basic neurology. And um, even though in overt conflict things happen fast and furiously, if you've re-scripted yourself, you've at least got that other option there. It's possible, right? So in this pattern, you attempt to hold your ground. You're neither boiling in anger, no cowering in retreat. Um, you attempt to hold your ground. You have good ideas about what you might say, like right now. Um, you're able to compose responses that are constructive. Constructor, constructive either in effectively calming everybody down to be able to discuss things or in preventing violence, or getting the community to, in some sense, get back together, something, right? So mindfulness practice um, cultivates this capacity to stay present in the face of this strong discord, emotional intensity, um, it, um, without backing down. So it gives us a chance to get out of impulsivity without violating our own values. So 
Um, it's, it's a form of intentional self-transformation. It takes work, a lot of work, in fact, <laughs> um, but it can be done. And um, it gives you other options in difficult moments. So in a pandemic, in times of political conflict, it's important to feel that sense of collectivity. Um, how are we all interlinked? How are we all together? You know, how does both virus and the state of mind emanating out from virus, um, how does it, what does it do to us? Um, and how does it go viral and get transferred to everybody else? How does political divisiveness go, vi go viral? Um, so it's a good time to work on our emotions. Not that you're managing them, but you've pre-scripted some of them so that they stay in alignment with your values. They don't have you screaming um, pathetically at um, um, other people um, in doing and acting in ways you simply do not want to act in. So um, um, it's a good time to work on interstates so that when time comes where you really need them, you've got something there. So we're clearly at uh, some kind of threshold here, a historically potent moment. Times like these raise big questions. Who do I want to be? Who do you want to be? Um, who do we want to be? What do we want to be collectively? Um, it's a time to ask what's now possible for us. Um, what can we do differently? We, we need to make big changes. Um, what can we be as a community? What tools can we call upon? Well, um, mindfulness is one of these practices. You can use it in all kinds of different ways. Um, it has many possibilities. Um, obviously, it's not a panacea. Um, panacea to a pandemic or to anything. Um, it's one tool. It's a useful strategy, but to do what? To open self-awareness, to extend freedom to yourself, to choose how you want to respond, to be able to maintain presence in your values rather than falling back into habitual patterns that have always had negative consequences. So mindfulness is clearly a tool for difficulty. And difficulty is clearly what we've got. Um, okay, um, I should stop and we should have questions. Um, so, please. Okay, so just a reminder, thank you, Dale, first of all, and just a reminder that if you have questions, you can enter them into the chat feature and we will try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, so, one of the first questions that came up was, uh, do you have any, you know, in, in this day and age, there's an app for everything, um, and there are several mindfulness and meditation apps. Have you ever used such a thing? Do you have any recommendations for any alumni who might be looking for something to help guide them in their mindfulness practice? I have, but it was so long ago, I'm not up on them, and I don't use, I don't use them, but I think they're incredibly useful. Um, they, we all need help to maintain mindfulness. And um, an app right there on your phone. Um, I know many people who are far better meditators than I am who in fact use those. So um, good tool. I can't recommend which ones right now are worth your considering, but um, just go through and have a look. I mean, you can sample almost all of them. So um, sample your way through, but I, I, I recommend them. I think they're good. Okay, great. And for those who are perhaps just starting out on this practice, um, I think, you know, it can possibly be a little overwhelming to, to sort of visualize what the end of mindfulness or, you know, not, we know it's always a work in progress, but what the potential end of mindfulness could look at and look like and see yourself in the present and wonder how you get there. Are there any sort of concrete first initial steps that someone can take to sort of ease themselves in? Um, what would be a great way to get started? Yeah, good way to get started. Well, the way it's typically taught at the beginning 
is um, what Buddhists called, and now what everybody calls mindfulness of breathing. So it's conscious respiration. So it's very easy. It's the most calming thing you'll ever done, uh, you will have ever done. And it may be of all the millions of things I've learned from Buddhism, this may be the best. Um, so um, basically, um, just pay attention to your breathing. Just be mindful of, okay, I'm breathing in, I'm breathing out, in and out, and you go through this pattern and keep your mind focused there. You'll find your mind drifts away almost immediately. Right? Um, so you come back, you do it again. It both helps you develop awareness of breathing, which is handy, we'll get to that in a second, but it develops focus. It gives you something to focus on. It allows you to have an object to focus on that's very close to you. Why is it a good thing? Well, um, when you're up there on the stage and you're about to play your piano or sax concert, when you're on the free throw line and you're about to shoot that game winning or losing free throw, um, get some oxygen going in your system, right? Take it in and get a lot of oxygen passing through your blood um, into all parts of your body, especially your brain, so that you've, you've got it. Um, that tool, it's a great place to start. And um, meditators who I know have been meditating for decades and decades still do that. I still do that. And I've been doing this for a long time. Um, it's the best, you know. So I'd say start there, keep that going. Um, but then branch off into all kinds of other different possibilities. So similarly, in terms of, of beginning mindfulness practice, some folks are wondering, you know, what if you're trying to begin this practice with your kid? Um, is there an age that is too young? Um, is there a way to perhaps break this down and make it easier for kids? Would breeding be a great place to start with them too? Um, have you tried doing this with a child? Um, no. Um, and frankly, I don't recommend it doing it with your child. Um, <laughs> let somebody else teach them mindfulness practice, unless you've got really an extraordinary relationship with them. Um, let them learn from somebody else, um, and then know that you can call upon that in times of little crises between you and your child, that you can say, okay, let's do this moment of mindfulness. Let's gather ourselves, right? You hate me right now, but come on, give me a break for just a minute. Let's gather. Um, so um, I, I think children can learn it. Children love to learn it. Um, um, and uh, I've never taught it to children, but um, um, it, anybody who's good at teaching children anything would be good at teaching children. Um, an interesting question come up. Uh, someone said they, you know, in their mindfulness practice often struggle with navigating the balance between, you know, staying true to themselves and their values and holding their ground and also staying open to what other people are trying to say to facilitate sort of constructive dialogue, especially if that's someone that they're close to. Um, do you have any tips for how mindfulness can help them navigate that inherent tension? Yes, I do. Um, where, um, if it's not already, incorporate into your values openness to the other right nothing could be more important right so that at least you've got all kinds of values and those values include what you think about health care and what you think about the current government what you think about how um COVID-19 should be handled you've got all of those but, um there are some basic modes of um mindfulness of being open being a listener, being able to hear what people are saying, being able to hear what they're really saying back behind what they're on the surface saying. Um, all of those values help you, help me to be open to others who I really fundamentally disagree with. Because in the end, inclusivity has to be one of our values. I mean, yes, there may be limits out there on inclusivity, but don't draw those, those lines too close, right? You have a wide open, highly diverse, democratic society, 
you're going to get a lot of people who you're not going to want as your next door neighbor. And you're not going to want as your son or daughter. And um, but you will have to face. Um, so um, that basic value is one of the values that helps you stick with your values and address others. Another, of course, is honesty, where at a certain point, you just have to say, listen, you know, I know you're my relative. Um, I know I'm married into this family, but I really don't agree with you. And I'm not gonna. <laughs> this isn't likely to change. And I'll tell you why. Um, so, you know, you have to be who you are um, with honesty, compassion, sensitivity, generosity, openness. Thank you. Another attention that someone brought up is the idea of mindfulness being, you know, staying present and aware of the current situation, um, but also, you know, observing your own uh, feelings and, and daydreams. Sort of the, is, there, is there a point at which, you know, the sort of initial layer of external observation and mindfulness versus internal observation and mindfulness, do those, are those ever at odds? Is there a time when you sort of transcend the fact that those could be at odds? And how might you get there? Wow, great question. Um, that's fabulous. Um, and I don't have a clear answer to that, but, um, but um, you have to be mindfulness of where the focus right now will be best placed. Um, that's important. Um, so um, if it is in listening, that is really openness to what's happening out there, right? But you may be feeling and thinking things about what's happening out there. You better be aware of too, right? So I'm trying to be sensitive and open to you. And you're saying things that mm, are really hateful to me. And my blood is boiling. Um, I, I better be aware of that. Um, I can even curtail a little bit of my sensitivity for you for a moment while I check in with myself. Now, of course, these go together. We're flying back and forth, and we do this naturally all the time. We're aware of what's happening there, what's happening here, and what do I want to be? That's the what do I want to be is the hardest one to weave down into your present moment. Um, the other two we're, we're, we're good at, right? We've done them, but um, cycling back and forth, very important. We all learn our own patterns, how to handle them. So, you know, um, uh, to going off of that a little bit response there, um, you know, you talked about mindfulness can make you better at anything, sort of whatever your goal is, mindfulness can help you with that. And, you know, one person posed the question of, you know, you've got, so you've got these two people, these two groups opposing sides of this protest. Will mindfulness sort of help you sort of center yourself and your values, whatever they are, or will they help you open yourself up to other people's values as well? Because if they're just sort of repeatedly setting yourself in the same values and they're at odds with other people, doesn't that also make it harder to have a conversation with that person that's productive? Yeah, yeah. well, it, it, um, we all sense that it can be an either or there, right? Um, we have to be who we are. We just are. We can't be other than who we are. Um, but if we're really going to be in a conversation and not just in a screaming match or a civil war, you know, we've, we've got to be open and sensitive. And it's really important to be listening and to be listening carefully. Now, one of the, one of the things that <clears throat> I learned theoretically in graduate school is how to, do, how to really do dialogue. So that whatever you're hearing, you're asking yourself, okay, what do I think? Um, and I've taught students, whatever you're reading, don't just memorize it. You know, I taught, I assigned something you read, just memorize it. Um, ask yourself, what do I think about that? Every step of the way, um, have it sort of surface your own position for you. Let what you're reading tell you what you think and then try to work back and forth, right? What do I think that can be can contribute to what this thing says here, this person says? Um, how can we get into a dialogue? How can we do this openly to our own mutual benefit, right? Because that's what dialogue is supposed to do. We're both supposed to grow. 
right? And that's what a democratic society is supposed to be great at. We're not good at it right this moment. Um, in fact, we're miserable at it this moment. But those differences are supposed to be a good thing. It pushes us, presses us, makes us look at our own values, makes us go to a higher level of understanding of our own position, makes us shift our position, makes us learn from other people. Everybody's got something to teach, even if they don't know they it. Everybody can teach us something. And um, so learning that process of open communication and becoming comfortable with it, that's really learning something important. Um, you mentioned the very beginning of your your speech, your speech, uh, your presentation that uh, you know uh, mindfulness has expanded beyond its sort of Buddhist origins. Um, there have been a couple of questions of folks asking if there are any spiritual practices that are at odds with mindfulness. Um, if you can practice mindfulness as an atheist, is there any sort of limitation there in terms of faith or spirituality? Yeah. Okay. Well, the the limitation that I've just sort of skipped over here um, in my own presentation on mindfulness as it's practiced in the United States is that the basic definition is that it is a non-judgmental awareness of the present moment, right? Internal and external. But if it's non-judgmental, you're missing something. So um, as, I, as I mentioned, there are kinds of Buddhist meditation and, and every tradition has this, so this is just Buddhist, where you're really focused on building your values and cultivating those in such a way that they're built down into your life, right? Um, so, um, so that kind of meditation is an addition to the way mindfulness is typically practiced in the US. But um, if you only learn mindfulness-based stress reduction, you've learned a tool that will be invaluable forever, right? So you, know, you don't need to add to that, but there's more, there's, there's plenty of others. Um, there are in, in Buddhism something called insight meditation, which is basically thinking, um, to think clearly and sometimes to be guided by something you're reading or hearing and to just ponder. And those of you alums, and I'm very grateful for this award, um, remember, you've got to keep reading, right? Keep thinking, right? Your mind needs to stay active and alive. And that's, that's a form of meditation. I've been teaching you that for years. Um, whatever you do can be understood as a form of practice so that you can do it mindfully, carefully, thoughtfully. You can do it better if you're just attentive to how you do it. Um, uh, Harking back to our discussion of um, conversations with people who have different values than you and you know, trying to be open in those conversations. Um, how do you approach that when, you know, do you, how do you approach understanding that like, yes, okay, this is your valid point of view, but I disagree when science and facts seem to be so easily disregarded these days um, and truth is uh, no longer valued as it perhaps once was or should be. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a hard one. Um, and that's come up more now than it ever has before. Um, what, what's important to remember though, is that everybody's got their facts and um, the facts are not really just a pile of things that everyone has an equal share in. Um, that um, if you're a Trump person, you've got your facts. And those facts don't seem to be known by the other people, right? And, and vice versa, right? So that um, um, we can't just say, well, wait a minute, what about the facts? Well, you have to understand that you know, people just see those differently. And facts will be. Uh, understood differently, honestly, from different points of view. But, you know, fortunately, um, we have things that are based on empirical research and that are 
um, thought by a majority of people who are expert in a particular area. And when you've got those on your side, you've got something important. So the, the point is though, how do you present this to someone? Who, you gotta be sensitive, who's going to be able to hear you say that without just sounding authoritarian or dictatorial, right? How do you learn to teach um, the results of research to somebody who's just not accustomed to that way of thinking? Um, that kind of patience is hard to come by, um, but we need to understand that differences are real and, um, and they're not gonna go away by just saying, well, I've got science on my side, you know? We all know that everybody's got science on their side, one way or another. Um, taking a quick departure from ideas of, of, sort of communicating with other people, um, there have been some questions about how you can use mindfulness to navigate sort of uh, turbulent times in your own personal life, whether that is grief or whether you are trying to um, advocate for yourself professionally. Um, what are some tools that you can use in those two specific situations if you are trying to, to navigate your way through um, grieving? in particular, or if you are stuck in a, a rut at work and you're trying to take the next step, you know, what are some opportunities that mindfulness can be helpful for there? Yeah, that's, that's really important. And there's a lot to, to learn here. Um, how do you um, stop your patterns of self-critique when they get out of hand? Um, how do you um, learn to encourage yourself when the world out there just keeps hammering away at you and discouraging you. How do you learn to recognize what you have to offer? And even though you've just lost your job, what can you do to regroup? Well, um, you can build your own, you know, like, let's say call them mindfulness exercises where you re-script um, yourself in a job interview and re-script yourself by going over successes in your life. Um, you can teach yourself what it felt like when things really worked well for you. Okay, let me shift to um, um, actual pain. Um, mindfulness practice is used a lot in hospitals for pain, handling pain, reducing pain. Um, and the, the basic teaching goes like this, that you need to learn not to turn away from pain and resistance, not to stiffen up, right? um, not to go against the pain, but to be able to relax, calm down, pain's in your arm, okay? Let your attention go there and feel it, right? Um, feel it, feel yourself being able to bear it. Um, and, um, um, and so you work on Letting your body do its healing process. So you're shaking your limbs and you're breathing deeply, deeply, and you're you're able to gather yourself to face something that's just excruciating. Now, admittedly, not everybody's going to be able to do that when it's all the way terribly painful. But there are times where, um, you know, <laughs> um, where that's really important. Um, kind of meditation have. There are stories about Gandhi where they're doing a, an operation without anesthetics on him. I don't even know if this is a apocryphal or true story, but they're cutting him open and he's there in some deep Gandhi state. Um, and, you know, he's still there, but um, he can reroute the pain. He can deal with that. Um, now, that's an extreme story we can all do that to some extent. And you can use the word pain where it's emotional pain, where it's physical pain, where it's relational pain um, and extend it. Use the basic mindfulness strategies to develop your own that are gonna work for you in your own specific circumstances. Design your own. Um, we've also had a couple of questions about your mindfulness practice in particular. Um, can you talk about how your practice has evolved over the years and perhaps what some of the challenges have been and, and how you might relate mindfulness to your understanding of enlightenment? Yikes. 
Yeah, it's a small question. <laughs> um, I'm used to that though. Some of you who were my students remember somebody in the class um, doing that to me at the end of the class, right? Okay, okay, Professor Wright, you know, let's hear about you. Um, okay, well, my practice of meditation is old, long, and, you know, amateurish. I'm not among the best meditators I know. Um, but I learned initially when I was 13 years old, um, where my family um, volunteered to have the one foreign exchange student who was going to be in our uh, town. Um, I was 13, so she was going to come stay with us for a year. She, and it turns out she was a Thai, a Chinese Thai Buddhist. And when I was 13, I didn't know anything about Buddhism. Um, and um, so I teased her for being a Buddhist, in fact, I feel horrified um, now in retrospect, but she took it well. She teased me for being 13. She was a high school student, so you're just a stupid kid. And, um, so um, I walked by her room one day and there she is meditating. I think she had just been in conflict with my mother. And there she is sort of gathering herself from the stress. And I said, what are you doing? She said, she explained what she's doing. And she, I said, well, okay, can you teach me? I'm like, how do you do that? So we do it. Um, and she teaches me. And so I did it a couple of times with her and then sort of had that and learned to do it. And then later on, the 60s happened when Buddhism appeared as a thing and Hinduism in American culture. And um, so I began to do it then. So you know, it's been well over half century for me. But I've never been, you know, that good at it. It plays a major role in my life. Um, let me confess that before going into class to teach you, um, what I typically do if I have time, gather myself a little bit, okay, Dale, what are you gonna be doing there? Are we gonna have enough magnanimity to be open to questions? Are you gonna really sense what's happening with them? Are you gonna be attentive to what they're learning or not learning? Um, are you going to be sensitive to whether you're communicating or not? So just gather myself a little bit. Um, so for me, meditation is, I, I do meditate every morning, um, occasionally during the day, other times, short periods of time. But I, I'll do it before um, some event, right? I did it this morning before this event. So it's just a matter of, okay, who am I anyway? Um, what's going on? Um, what do I want to communicate? Who do, we, who do I want to be? Now, I rarely get to actually be who I want to be, but I like to think my little meditations gather me a little closer. Well, thank you so much for that, Dale. I'm afraid that we are um, coming up on the end of our time here today. There have been many questions that we haven't been able to get to. Um, I'm sure you're not surprised that there are a lot of your former students who are thrilled to have had this time with you. And um, uh, I apologize that I couldn't, couldn't squeeze in more questions. Um, but I wanted to thank you so much, Dale, for sharing, um, again, your, your wisdom and your thoughts with us. I know that um, I can speak on behalf of all of your former students when I say that um, you have left a, a lasting mark on all of us. And um, hearing from you again has been a really wonderful experience. So thank you very much. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, everyone. Um, I, 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 um, I'm honored by this award. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dale. And I also want to make sure that we thank Margo for hopping in and taking care of both the intro and the Q&A for us. Um, I thought that she would have a much better take as a former student of Dale's than I would as someone who studied, studied an entirely different discipline. Uh, but thank you all. Uh, we had about 250 attendees at the max. And so thank you very much for joining us this morning. As a reminder, if you missed any portion of this, it will be available uh, online on YouTube in a couple of days. And we'll make sure that we circulate that link. And please stay tuned for information on our next Alumni ACL Speakers uh, conversation, which will feature Lewis Hook, who is the 2020 honoree for service to the community, uh, in conversation with his son, Randall, who's also an alumnus, um, and I think a classmate of Margo's. So again, thank you so much, Dale. Thank you, Margo. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. <laughs>